to look at history, um, ourselves, Spiral Arc um, and Harif, are going many, many years back, uh, where we have had a lot of interesting programs together until Lynn came to the surface and to this on the stage, we did mainly Jewish uh, history from the east, from basically um, Europe and maybe America, maybe South Africa, but we never touched something that we didn't know enough. And um, I think that Lynn, we, as we all know, have opened up a whole branch of knowledge that Jews weren't aware of. To give you a, a little example, uh, we had people who um, register for this event through us, and some people said Jews had to live left in Morocco. We thought that we had, they had it so good there that all of them stayed there. So I think our ignorance as far as um, the Jews of um, the North Africa and Arab, Arab countries is so limited. And uh, we all have to thank um, Lynn and her uh, initiative to, um, for opening up this world before us. And I'm glad that more and more Ashkenazim are coming to our joint meetings and are fascinated by um, what Lynn has to sell at Sender. Um, I said before about the, um, um, the uh, benefit of Corona. We only hear about the horrible things and obviously they are horrible. But I think that the idea that we can sit with people from California and uh, Spain or wherever and experience an, a, an intellectual and learning experience is something so incredible that it's really breathtaking. And then, so um, this is a real fantastic uh, thing for us. And I have to say that both the Spiral Arc and uh, Harif are not ever defeated by anything. So when, uh, whenever there is difficulty, we are looking at it only as an obstacle and we are trying to overcome it. And I think that maybe women are more overcomable than men, although Lawrence is a different species. <laughs> and Robin. Uh, and Robin, yes. <laughs> but I think that um, I, can, I meet a lot of women and I can see that the energy and the feel that they are here on earth in order to do something worthwhile is very special. So I know that this evening is a fantastic e opportunity for us. And if you haven't yet re read Uprooted, which has become um, an international bestseller of Lynn, please do so because it is opening a world of knowledge which we all so need. And if you need an improvement on your Hebrew, uh, Spiral Arc is happy to do it even on Zoom. Lynn, thank you so much for what you are and what you do, and Lawrence for being such a support for both us and Harif. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nietzsche, for that wonderful introduction. I don't think Spiral Arc needs much introduction to those of us in the UK. It is the pioneering institute for Jewish learning and education. Um, and I certainly can't match what you do or what you have done in the past decades. It is a great pleasure to be here and to welcome you all. We have a hundred people participating in this Zoom talk. And it is extremely exciting to know that you come from all over the world, um, from Spain, from Israel, from Canada, from America, and of course from the UK. I just need to explain to you what's going to happen. I'm going to present my PowerPoint to you. And then when I finished, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Uh, the best thing to do is to click on the icon which says uh, chat and just write your question in.
So the subject of my talk tonight is why did the Jews of Morocco leave? It may be a strange question to ask, but it is slightly controversial because um, there, there does seem to be a lot of ambivalence over the reasons why they left. And just to give you some figures, in 1948, there was a population of 265,000 Jews. Today, there are only 2,500, mostly living in Casablanca. And Morocco had the, uh, the largest Jewish community in the Arab world. So obviously we need to know exactly why and how they left. Now, one thing is certain, and that is they were not expelled overnight, like the Iraqi Jews, for instance, or the Egyptian Jews after Suez in 1956, or, or the Yemenites in 1949. They did not leave en masse, like the Libyan Jews after 1948, or the Syrian Jews in 1948. And their exodus was really spread out over quite a long period, about, about 30 years, in fact. Another difference between Morocco and the other Arab countries is that they weren't subject to quite the same state-sanctioned laws that affected communities in, in other countries. For instance, their property was not confiscated although plenty of Moroccan Jews actually did lose their property. They were not stripped of their passports, that's if they had them. Um, and so this was a slightly different situation from other communities. In the early 1950s, when absorbing Jewish refugees from Arab lands, Israel did not actually give priority to the Moroccan Jews. Morocco was then under the French, French protectorate. They had suffered a pogrom at Oujda and uh, Gerada in 1948. And in fact, 48 Jews were killed in that uh, massacre. But this wasn't enough for Israel to give them priority. They, Israel did not consider they were in as urgent need as other uh, Middle Eastern communities. And Israel actually operated a selection process, uh, giving priority to the young and able-bodied Moroccan Jews. So many Jews you hear may say that they left Morocco out of Zionism. And it is true that the Moroccan Jewish community was a very pious one, a very traditional one, and they uh, hankered for Jerusalem. They thought of themselves in exile in Morocco, and they did have this age-old yearning uh, to go back to the Holy Land. Uh, but was that enough of a reason to leave Morocco? You might also say, you might also have heard it say that the Zionists made them leave. And this suggests that they left reluctantly and against their will. So let's answer the question I've posed. Why did the Jews of Morocco leave? And to do so, I think uh, we need to go back in history and start at the very beginning. So the Jewish community of Morocco is a very old community. It goes back at least 2,000 years to Phoenician and Roman times, or even before. The original community was called the Toshavim. Basically, Morocco was composed of Jews, of Berbers, um, Christianity came along, and most of the Berbers converted to Christianity, and there were also pagans who really had no, no real religion. So this was the situation before the Arab conquest in the 7th century. 
the Arabs came, they converted the population, much of the population to Islam. A lot of the Berbers um, became Islamized and obviously some Jews converted to Islam as well. They had their ups and downs over history. After the 1492 Spanish Inquisition, the Jewish community of Toshavim were joined by the Megorashim, who reinvigorated Moroccan Judaism. And these were basically Jews of Spanish culture, and they brought with them their Spanish languages, and uh, they provided a sort of intellectual boost to Moroccan Judaism. So this synagogue you see here, the Beth El Synagogue of Casablanca, really symbolizes the rich Jewish heritage of Morocco. Morocco has actually spent a lot of money restoring synagogues, preserving cemeteries, restoring Jewish quarters. And it does this because actually, unlike other Arab countries, many Arab countries, Morocco does not try to erase its Jewish heritage on the contrary, it is quite a selling point. And it's obviously a selling point because it attracts many tourists. And tourism is the second biggest currency earner. And uh, thousands of tourists visit every year, including many Moroccan Israelis looking for their roots. So Morocco acknowledges its debt to Jewish and Berber culture. And in fact, their contribution is enshrined in the constitution that it passed in 2011. And this is something unique amongst Arab countries. Because the Jews were there for such a very long time and predated Islam, there is a sort of cultural symbiosis there, which mustn't be confused with coexistence. A cultural symbiosis signifying that Jews and Muslims really share a lot of the same culture. For instance, there's something really unusual about Morocco and that they have many saints, tombs, famous rabbis who are buried, and uh, Jews and Muslims pray at these tombs. Jews go on Hilula, uh, on yearly pilgrimage, to these saints' tombs, and this is again something unusual. Morocco is also unusual because it still maintains links with its Jews. Jews who can visit Morocco, and this is really quite unusual. An Iraqi Jew, for instance, can't go back to Iraq unless he risks his life. Jews who've tried to go back to Libya, same thing, can't really go back there. And another difference is that Morocco still has a king, whereas most Arab countries have suffered army coups and revolutions. And Morocco has escaped this fate. And the king assures a degree of stability and continuity. And the Jews are uniquely loyal to the king. And he, in turn, seems loyal to them. Although it has to be said throughout history, not all rulers were good to the Jews. And some were extremely cruel and intolerant. But historically, the monarch has benefited from uh, Jewish courtiers, Jewish advisors, and merchants. And they were, were the monarch's link to the outside world. On the other hand, Morocco, I think, is guilty of, of really um, a great deal of popular anti-Semitism. For instance, the word Jew was an insult and was often accompanied by the word in Arabic, hashak, uh, which basically means, excuse my French, you know, when I say Jew, uh, I didn't mean to insult you. And from a very early stage, in fact, from about the 15th century, Jews actually not only lived in a Jewish quarter, but they lived in a Jewish mela. 
And Amela was a walled ghetto, really. Uh, this is the, the Marrakesh ghetto dating back to 1558. It had one entrance, which was fortified, and the Jews were actually locked into this area, into this mela. There was only one entrance, and they were locked into this, um, this quarter for their own protection and their own safety. So you may well ask, why did they need to be protected? And protected against who? And the reality was that there were frequent attacks um, on the Jewish Mela, uh, especially at times of instability uh, between rulers, or simply because the mob wanted to loot their possessions with impunity. The Jews basically were subject to the king of Morocco in, in a way that the Jews were subject to the kings of medieval Europe. In other words, they were more, more or less his chattels, and they were important to the king because they paid a special tax, which was the jizya tax. And the jizya tax was really money, like protection money, which they paid, really, so that the sovereign would protect them against the mob. This was one of the main requirements of the dhimmi status. The dhimmi, under Sharia law, under Muslim Sharia law, Jews and Christians were dhimmis, which meant that they had few rights. They were allowed to practice their religion, but they had to submit to certain restrictions and humiliations. For instance, Jews in Morocco, when they left the Mela, had to take off their shoes when they walked through Muslim quarters. They had to wear special clothing. They were not allowed to study the Quran because that might lead to disputations with the Muslims. They were allowed to live, uh, to practice their religion, as I say, but they were always at the mercy of the mob and, and, the, and the whims of the king or the ruler of the day, who was not always very good. There were times in Morocco where the situation was extremely difficult for the Jews, especially in the 12th century when the fundamentalist Almohads ruled Morocco. And at, around this time, Christianity died out. Uh, there was a very strict form of Sunni Islam called Maliki practiced in Morocco. And sometimes it was so strictly enforced that the Jews were simply not tolerated at all. In 1492, for instance, um, under the influence of a puritanical preacher called Al-Magili, um, Jews of the Saharan town of Twat were actually wiped out and were completely massacred. Now, Morocco was not part of the Ottoman Empire, and that meant that the Dhimmi status lasted um, a lot longer than elsewhere in, in the Middle East and North Africa. In fact, it lasted until 1912, uh, when the French uh, set up their protectorate in Morocco, and this gave Jews greater rights and security under the law. The 19th century was a particularly difficult time for North African Jews, except for the Jews of Algeria, who managed to gain French citizenship and equal rights. But in Morocco, things were really quite different, and I will just read you a short passage from a traveler who went to Morocco in 1841. His name was Reverend Brooks, and he says, in Morocco, they, talking about the Jews, they are equally ground down by a barbarous despotism. The Moors consider that the object of a Jew's birth is to serve Muslim, 
and he is consequently subject to the most wanton insults. The boys, for their pastime, beat and torment the Jewish children. The men kick and buffet the adults. They walk into their houses at all hours and take the grossest freedoms with their wives and daughters. The Jews invariably coming off with a sound beating if they venture to resist. And many visitors to Morocco have actually documented these terrible insults and abuses on the Jewish community. And one particular problem that the Jews faced was forced conversion. And the most famous example of this is um, what happened to Sol Hatchwell. She was a Jewess who was asked to convert to Islam. She refused. She was actually martyred. I think she was beheaded. And this, this picture by Delacroix shows her uh, being beheaded. Um, there is a shrine to Sol Hatchwell in Fez, which you can visit today. Um, and she basically um, symbolizes this, this terrible pressure to convert that was very much um, part of, of uh, what the Jews had to, had to go through. Conversions also occurred in Fez. It is, it is thought that about a quarter of the inhabitants uh, are descended from converted Jews. And they still bear Jewish names like Shalom and Shabbat. Yeah, and, and one thing I noticed when I was sort of reading up on the history of Morocco was it really does have a pretty bad record for pogroms. Uh, for instance, in 1790, there was one in Tetuan. In 1903, in, in Setat. Uh, another one in, in Taza. In 1907, in Casablanca. And of course, in... 1912, there was a massacre in Fez. And this postcard actually shows you the aftermath of what happened in Fez in 1912, just before the French uh, set up their protectorate. And about 45 Jews um, actually were killed. A lot of the Jews tried to seek shelter in the Sultan's palace. Uh, they sought his protection in his menagerie where he kept his wild animals. And this photo shows you on the left, the tigers and the lions uh, in that cage and the people on the right in the other cage. So they still look to the ruler to protect them. Now, all this changed quite dramatically under the French protectorate um, and their legal situation did improve. Uh, the French also introduced um, education, westernized Western education. This is a picture of a group of girls at a school in Morocco, in Marrakesh, the Jacques Bigard school. Um, there was a group of well-meaning French Jews who decided to improve the lot of Jews in the Middle East and North Africa. And they set up a network of schools in 1860. Um, they were called the Alliance Israelite Universelle. And they sought to equip these Jews with the skills uh, to prosper in the modern world. And therefore, these Jews who actually only received a religious education up until then uh, were suddenly introduced to um, languages and science and maths. And for the very first time, girls were educated. Um, and the Alliance Israelite Universelle established their very first school in Morocco, in Tetuan, in 1862. And this started a process of introducing 
um, Jews to French culture, to the French language, a middle class started to develop. And before long, they were competing with Muslims for jobs. And later on, when Mor Morocco became independent, the Jews were really squeezed out and they were considered uh, rivals uh, for, for jobs um, by the Muslims. And they were also considered sort of collaborators uh, with the French. But actually, they were not completely accepted by the French either. And the French refused to give them a French citizenship as they had done in Algeria to the Jews. So the Jews were considered in a kind of limbo, neither native nor French. Um, what the um, psychologist Daniel Siboni calls entre deux, neither one nor the other. The Jews, the Jews, because they did not have complete security, were always trying to seek to obtain European passports uh, well before the establishment of Israel. And you find there were certain Jewish merchants, for instance, in the coastal towns who had British nationality, who were honorary consuls for European governments. And this way that gave them extra security. And there were also attempts to emigrate from Morocco. Moroccans went to uh, Venezuela and Brazil and other places. And this was a way of, ex of really escaping the precarious existence of, of life in Morocco. Now, when you speak to Jews in Morocco, you often hear them extolling the king of Morocco, they have fantastic loyalty to the king. And this partly derives from the role that the king was meant to have played in World War II. He famously declared, there are no Jews, only Moroccans. Now, uh, there's a myth that uh, he wore the yellow star and asked for 20 more for his family. And he stood up to the Vichy uh, government that was in place in Morocco, in fact, throughout North Africa. Uh, but, but I think that uh, many historians have actually refuted that myth. He ended up signing every single anti-Jewish decree, although he might have delayed doing so. So under the Vichy government during World War II, the Jews were subject to quotas in schools and universities. They were expelled from the professions. They were not allowed in public parks and public places. And they were sent back to the teeming mellers from the European quarters of, of uh, Moroccan towns. Um, the verdict of one Moroccan magazine was that he was just but powerless. Uh, Mohammed, the future Mohammed V. Uh, real power lay with the French resident general and not with the King of Morocco. Uh, also in Morocco, it is not very well known that there were labor camps and um, there's not an awful lot left of these labor camps that were in the Sahara Desert. The inmates were actually building the Trans-Sahara Railway. And there were several thousand Jews in these labor camps, including Moroccan Jews of British nationality. And this fact is not really terribly well known. And the Moroccan Sultan did not really put up a fight. He did not say anything about these places. Um, and I think that's another um, uh, more proof that he didn't really have power under the Vichy government. So World War II ends and Morocco wants its independence from France. I mentioned the 1948 riots in Oujda and Gerada in which 48 Jews uh, were killed, but Jews were also caught up in other disturbances leading up to independence in 1956. 
And these, I think, played a part in making Jews wanting, want to leave Morocco. Uh, there was a particular riot in 1954 called the Petit Jean riot, which actually had nothing to do with what was going on in, in Israel um, in, with the conflict there. Uh, six Jews were tortured and burnt to death. And I think you can only explain this riot by the fact that uh, the mob were looking for a scapegoat. They wanted to vent their frustration with the French. Um, and they took, took out their frustration on the Jews. In 1953, at Ujda, four Jews were killed. In 1954, six Jews were killed. 1955, at Mazagan, 200 Jews made homeless in a riot. 1955, at Sagan, homes were burnt down. Wadi Zen, seven Jews were killed. And the result was a third of the Jewish population of Morocco actually emigrated before independence in 1956. And the press reports at the time spoke of a pogrom atmosphere. Uh, but uh, as soon as Morocco became independent, the government enforced a ban on emigration. The Misgeret, which was the underground Zionist movement, began to organize illegal immigration, emigration of 29,000 Jews. And this took place um, in a clandestine manner. Um, operations happened in the dead of night. People had to leave without anything uh, in order to make it to Israel. There was one particular operation called Operation Mu Mural, which in included the smuggling of over 500 children um, without their parents. This picture shows you the ill-fated Egoz, also known as the Pisces, which actually capsized in 1961. This was a um, a, a misgeret boat, um, a rickety ramshackle boat, as you can see. 42 Jews drowned and their Spanish machine operator. And this caused a terrible scandal, actually. And it shocked both, uh, both Israel and the Moroccans into perhaps lifting the, the immigration ban. There were also natural disasters, such as the 1960 earthquake in Agadir. And this was reported at the time to have killed 1,500 Jews. And that was half the Jewish community out of a, a, a town that, had, uh, that lost 15 or 20,000 people. And several hundred survivors sought to emigrate to Israel following this earthquake. So ever increasing pressure uh, built up to let the Jews lead, leave. And this led to Operation Yachin, when King Hassan II, who'd taken over from uh, Mohammed V on the throne uh, in 1961, uh, agreed to let the Jews go. And actually, this was done with hard cash. Israel ransomed each Jew for $250 a head. There followed a mass exodus to Israel, mainly, of 87,000 Jews. Now, the late 1950s and 1960s were a time of Arabization. So Jews who spoke French and who considered themselves of French culture were felt increasingly alienated. There was the rise of the nationalist Istiklal Party, Istiklal Party. And in 1958, Morocco joined the Arab League. President Nasser visited the country. Zionism became a crime, meaning that Jews could be arrested on the slightest pretext and jailed. 
For instance, one Jew was arrested for possessing a Keren Kayemet calendar, another a blue and white kippah. Uh, Morocco joined the Arab League economic boycott, and so on. There were forced conversions again, girls abducted, um, and their names announced in the local paper. I came across, actually, someone told me the story of an attempted abduction of a girl. A uh, family found her the next day in a different town, but within a couple of days, the family had arranged to fly to Paris. Uh, they left the key to their home under the doormat for the abductors of their daughter to help themselves to their house. Every time tensions rose between Israel and the Arabs, Jews in Morocco felt threatened. And this is what happened in 1967 when 40,000 Jews left. These were often middle-class Jews, professional Jews, many abandoning their businesses and property, and most moved to France or Canada. So where are we today? Even though there are only 2,500 Jews left in Morocco, Moroccan Jews are actually central to Morocco's foreign policy. Um, in the 1970s, a French author uh, called Gilles Perrault wrote a book uh, which actually slammed Morocco and the king of Morocco was Hassan II at the time for his human rights abuses. The king decided something needed to be done to improve Morocco's image and how better than uh, to use the Jews. And so he brought in Andre Azulay, who I had the pleasure of meeting just a few months ago. Here he is. Um, and Andrew Az Azulay, who's a, who was a Moroccan Jew, but who had lived outside Morocco for 28 years, in fact, became the architect of a new strategy. And that strategy involved uh, forging links between uh, Jews and, and Muslims in Morocco and bolstering Morocco's foreign policy claims. Uh, Morocco's foreign policy was really dictated by its, its ambitions in Western Sahara. In 1975, uh, Morocco decided to lay claim to Western Sahara, which had been under Spanish control. And um, they started the Green March. Hundreds of thousands of Moroccans marched on Western Sahara to lay claim to uh, that region. Now, in order to legitimize um, their claims to Western Sahara, the Moroccan government really needed uh, Western support and particularly American support. And how better to bolster, uh, to get American support than to actually show that they were philo-Semitic, that they were good to the Jews. And that's why Azulay really started his strategy of um, interfaith initiatives, of film festivals, and um, sort of many, many uh, initiatives really to show how good Morocco was for the Jews. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of truth in this, obviously, uh, because actually Jews are allowed to practice freely in Morocco. They have a very lively cultural life in Morocco, um, and they are, they are allowed to live a Jewish life unmolested. But the truth is, that this is a very small community, it's a dwindling community, and maybe in a couple of generations there won't be any Moroccan Jews left. This is one of the synagogues in Marrakesh that the Moroccan king has, um, has helped restore. Absolutely beautiful synagogue, 
uh, but will it be an empty building soon? Um, many of these synagogues no longer have services. Very few people, very few Jews actually live in these communities and it's all really just for show. Now you hear um, Jews, um, this is an Andalusian, this is an example actually of the links with Israel. I mean, the king has gone quite far to forge links with Israel. Uh, the Andalusian Orchestra of Ashdod recently paid a visit to Morocco, and this is them, I think, in December of, this, of last year. Um, and this is quite unique uh, amongst Arab countries. So the king has actually gone quite far to normalize relations between Israel and the Arab world. Uh, you do hear a lot of Jews who, who actually say life was very good, um, but I think there is a, a paradox because Jews who came from the Mela or from mixed areas usually have a completely different experience of, of life in Morocco from those Jews who come from comfortable middle class areas, um, you know, insulated from the power of the mob, insulated from harassment and violence in the street. Um, in fact, these Jews, I would say, lived in a kind of bubble. Um, so there is this dichotomy between Jews who lived in mixed areas uh, and, and Jews who lived in their, in their middle-class bubbles. Why do so many Jews say that they left out of Zionism? I think a lot of Jews actually as a matter of pride did not want to admit that they left because they had to. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. The owner of a large and prosperous factory in Marrakesh, Mordechai, abandoned his business, his house and motherland to come to Israel with nothing. His daughter, Rachel, diagnosed with a rare disease, was refused treatment and eventually became blind. Yet Mordechai told his Israeli-born children and grandchildren that his motive was Zionist. We need to give the king credit. I think he's been very bold um, and he has uh, being an honest broker in the politics of the Middle East uh, and he's still trying to play a part in the peace process. Um, and the Jews who, st who live in Morocco uh, have been very grateful for his support. Uh, but as one said to the writer Robert Satlov, yes, we have it very good in Morocco, the king protects us, but we have a suitcase packed. And the reason for that is the king actually walks a tightrope. There were several attempts to depose him in the 1970s. And if the king goes, then there is no future for the remaining Jews in Morocco. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, very happy to take questions. And can I start with two questions which we received in advance? One was from Shaul Sadka, um, our friend who's, who lives in London. And he asks, why do Moroccan Jews keep voting for Bibi? Actually, he described Bibi with a few uh, expletives, which I won't, <laughs> which I won't repeat. Uh, but I think the reason why they vote for the right wing, why they vote for Likud, is because these Moroccan Jews carry the memory of, of anti-Semitism in Morocco, the fear of the mob, um, the fear of, of harassment. Um, and, and I think this is, this is really why, uh, why they vote for the right wing in Israel. Um, and another question was uh, that I, I talked about the Sultan's philo-Semitism during World War II. What, was, uh, what were my sources for this? This was a question from Marjorie Dan in Toronto. 
Um, my sources were uh, the historians Michel Abidbol and uh, Georges Ben Soussan, who actually do say that power did not really rest with the, with the Sultan. Um, they were in the hands, the power was in the hands of the resident general, Nogues. So even though he wanted to help the Jews, he wanted to delay these anti-Jewish decrees, uh, he finally ended up by signing every single one of them. So let's have a look and see what other questions. The only question I've had so far is, is it being recorded? Oh, okay. I, um, Are there any other questions? Any questions? Uh, we've got 100 people on the line, so it's best if you put them through the chat, because if we open it up, I don't want 100 people all saying things at the same time and not being able to control it. Ah, from Rika, we've got one. Okay, where's, oh yeah. Uh, Rika Infante. My 90-year-old my mother has been telling me over the years during, that during the Holocaust, there were rumors circulating <laughs> that if the Nazis came into Morocco, there were crematoriums being prepared to exterminate the Jews. Do I know anything about this? Well, Rika, I have no evidence to suggest that there were crematoriums being prepared for the Jews. Uh, funnily enough, the same rumors circulate in Tunisia amongst Jews there. Um, but there is no evidence to suggest uh, that the Vichy regime was preparing the extermination or the de deportation of Jews from Morocco. I think uh, it was just busy trying to govern the place and uh, deportation and extermination was really uh, not one of their priorities. Uh, Rika, you've been unmuted if you want to add anything. Uh, no, actually, thank you for that. Um, I don't really know anything. I just know that my mother was born in Larache. I was born in Tangiers. Really, during the time that I was there, just five years, I can I only know things from you know from what they were telling me. But uh, other people that I know from Tangiers also were reporting the same thing. So, but I I just want to see what validity there was, you know, to these rumors going. Right. Uh, nothing. I, I haven't ever come across this actually. Uh, there were yeah. Jews deported from Libya to Bergen-Belsen. There were also uh, resistance fighters deported from Tunisia uh, in 1943. But these were the only instances of, of deportation that, that I read about. But I'll keep looking. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Dan? Okay, maybe you'd like to put your question. I've got to find okay. Dan. Darling. All right then. Dan Barzell, who's in Florida. How do you think the economy generally has done in Morocco during the past? I hear it hasn't been great. Not sure if it is bad. And do you have any idea if it affected the Jews that remained? Uh, well, Dan, I'm not an expert. <laughs> on this um, but uh, obviously I think people did stay away from Morocco uh, after the Arab Spring they were a bit hesitant to visit Morocco has had a terrorism problem uh, for instance in 2003 in Casablanca um, there were there was a, a an attack um, tourism is is very important as I as I've mentioned um, I, I don't really know a great deal about the economy in Morocco. Maybe somebody else does. Perhaps Dan does. Dan can speak Dan, now. Dan, maybe you know, you know more about it than I do? I only hear it anecdotally from, you know, people I would run into and they would say that it's doing quite poorly and, and it isn't a great place to be and they prefer to be somewhere in Europe or in North America to make a better living. Right. So I think, I think the country has struggled. I, I just didn't know if you had any recent testimonials. No, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, the history was yeah. fascinating, though. I really hadn't heard in much detail. And thank you for the talk. It was great. 
Oh, okay. thank you very much. Okay, yeah. another question you, Sarah Wald, is from there. Sarah Wald. How did Morocco's treatment of Jews compare to other Middle Eastern countries? Uh, apologies if you said this. Well, I, I hope that I've explained that uh, there was this, this sort of dichotomy between royal protection on the one hand, and on the other hand, popular hostility. You know, there's this anti-Semitism, popular anti-Semitism that's been there through the ages. And I think the Jews were always vulnerable to that. And they always looked to the king to protect them, you know, from this, this anti-Semitism. But there wasn't that degree of state-sanctioned persecution that you got in other countries. And there were certainly, nobody was ever executed, although there were arrests and people were jailed. Um, you know, no, nobody was, was ever executed for Zionism, for instance. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you. So. Thanks. Uh, nice to see you too. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed the first bit. It was technical okay. problems. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a common problem. <laughs> Uh, can I say a bit more about the labor camps? Oh, sorry, lost that. Just <coughs> yeah, I hear now. Um, yeah, well, sorry, just going. Um, yeah, that's from Ronit. Where are you, Ronit? Hello. Uh, so, yes, there were labor camps. Um, the prisoners were mainly defeated soldiers from the French army after the Vichy uh, regime took over in North Africa. They sent these defeated soldiers to these labor camps. There were also, there was a motley uh, variety of, of other, other people like um, Spanish political prisoners. Um, and there was one particular um, uh, camp called Bergent, which I think was mainly Jewish. Now, the conditions in these camps were terrible. They're basically in the middle of the desert. Uh, the they were not even uh, fenced in because obviously, if you wandered out of the camp, uh, you could easily die in the heat of the desert without food and water. Um, the, some of these prisoners did die because the conditions were terrible. Some were tortured. There was one particular method of torture called the tombeau, uh, which was um, putting, putting the prisoner in a, in a sort of open air grave and leaving him there day and night in the cold uh, of, of, of the night and in the heat of the, of the day with an inadequate water and, 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 uh, and food and, and obviously uh, dozens, dozens must have died. Uh, as a result of that. Uh, but but these, these camps are not well known. Um, there was a, a Moroccan magazine called Telkel, which did an, uh, an expose on, on them quite recently. Uh, and, and these camps, there's not an awful lot uh, left of them. Robert Satlov, who wrote a book on, on his stay in Morocco, he actually talks about them in his book. It's called Among the Righteous, uh, if you want to know more. Uh, so just one of those forgotten stories of, of the war. Yeah, Ronnie, we've got a lovely view of your ceiling. We'd love okay. to see your face. <laughs> and if you've got anything to add. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that, that was very interesting. I didn't know about um, Thank you. Thank you for organising this. Oh, uh, pleasure. Yeah. Okay, another, story, uh, another question Carol from Carol Sofair. Hello, Carol. Uh, where did the funding come from in preserving the beautiful, beautiful synagogues you have shown us? Well, the funding came from uh, the King of Morocco, the government of Morocco. He's uh, invested a great deal of money in this. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it's an investment in tourism. Um, and of course, it's wonderful to see Jewish heritage being preserved when many other Arab countries are busy uh, destroying theirs or letting it crumble the dust. Okay, uh, another question from Hannah Safair. Hello, Hannah. How integrated are the 2,500 Jews still living in Morocco today and how do they live 
how does this compare with other Arab nations? Well, I should say that the 2,500 Jews who still live in Morocco, many of them in Casablanca, live a full Jewish life. Um, they, um, they, I think they are very happy. Uh, uh, you know, and they, they, they have no complaints, uh, but obviously uh, when a community actually diminishes to such an extent uh, that, there, that the young people find that there is no future for them uh, and they leave, then there is, no, there is no real future for these Jews. And you find that quite a few of them already behave like expats, you know, they have, they have homes in France or elsewhere, and they spend maybe half the year in Morocco and half in France. So they're already uh, hedging their bets, you know, in case the political situation gets worse, in case the king is de deposed. You know, I think these Jews know that um, their fate is very much tied uh, with, with that of, of the king and the present government. Uh, another question? Oh, anything back from Hannah? Yeah. Did Hello. Answer your question? Hello, Hannah. Hey, that thank you. That was great. Thank you. Okay. That uh, doesn't sound like a female Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Hannah on the line. <laughs> okay, next one is Joseph Sassoon. Okay. Were the Germans in Morocco during World War II, was it like, what was it like yeah. in Casablanca? Uh, right. Well, the Germans were not in Morocco during World War II. Uh, they were sort of represented by the Vichy government. Uh, was it like the film Casablanca? Now, the film Casablanca shows a lot of um, refugees from Germany actually um, living in Morocco uh, and waiting until they could travel to the US or, or to other places. So there was a, a sort of refuge, Morocco was a sort of refuge in a way for these people. Um, and, and there were Jews who actually organized, uh, you know, their, um, you know, their existence in, in Casablanca. That's, that's where the film was, uh, was based, you know, these sort of expats who uh, who met in this bar uh, <laughs> and the whole story. Anyway, so there were no Jews, uh, sorry, there were no Germans in Morocco. Uh, in fact, the Allies um, began uh, conquering North Africa in, in 1942 uh, and um, the, the Germans were in Tunisia, they were not in Morocco. The, the Germans actually um, took control of Tunisia for six months in 1942, from uh, November 1942 to May 1943. And they set up labor camps in Tunisia uh, and thousands of, of Jews ha uh, were, were marched into these camps. Um, uh, but but the Germans were, were not in Morocco. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering, was it um, uh, entirely under the control of the Vichy government or were they, in fact, some free French uh, representatives there trying to take control? Uh, I, I don't think the free French um, were, were there. In fact, they were sent to these labor camps to build the Trans-Sahara Railway. All right. The Vichy government was very much in control until the Allies uh, managed to defeat. Uh, was it in control from the beginning? Because obviously the Germans marched into Paris at the beginning, but didn't go down to the south until much later in the south of France. At what stage did it become in control? Uh, I do believe from 1940 the Vichy okay. governments were set up in, in uh, Tunisia and Morocco and Algeria. Thank you very much. Okay, next question comes from Emile Cohen, and for once I found them on time, so you can ask it yourself, Emile. Hi. <laughs> um, oh, you want me to read it? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that uh, my impression is that the Jewish community in Morocco wasn't exactly as, as rich as the Jewish communities in the rest of the Arab world. In fact, I think they, they were poor economically. 
So is it possible that some of them went to Israel because they foresaw possibility of improvement of their standard of living? Uh, rather than the idea of being Zionist or otherwise. Some of them might have done so. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The great mass of Jews in Morocco were not rich. In fact, some of them were really poor. And they'd had a very bad time during World War II because uh, of these anti-Jewish laws that forced them back into the ghettos. And the ghettos were unsanitary, uh, they were crowded, and, and uh, a lot of them really suffered from, uh, from diseases, um, uh, um, trachoma, and this kind of thing. Um, so the, the Jews were, were not rich. There were some elite Jewish families in the coastal towns um, who, who actually, um, actually were very wealthy, and, and there were some very wealthy landowners. Um, who, who lost a lot of property um, and have never been compensated. Uh, but um, you're quite right. Um, I think the Jews of Morocco, uh, the great mass of them, the great mass of poor Jews, uh, moved to Israel uh, because they had nothing to lose, basically. Exactly. Um, yeah. Also, I mean, perhaps the Zionist propaganda at the time trying to bring them uh, over there, well, especially well, the I, young people only. I mean, that's I, I, a bit disappointing, yeah. Israel accepting the young only and not the old ones. Well, that was at the very beginning in the early 1950s, okay. uh, yeah. when they operated this selection process, but it all changed uh, after that. And Operation Yachin in the early 1960s was really all about mass, mass immigration into Israel. They didn't, they didn't select at that point. Right. Okay, Suad, you've Hello. had your hand up for a long time. I haven't seen a question, but I've seen your hand. So, do you, do you want to bring up your question now? Is Ian? Well, actually, it's, uh, uh, Suad's husband, Ian. My question, which was uh, really uh, related to the, the previous one, but not so much were the Jews poor, um, but how, how well off did they do in business and in the professions? Um, as in some other countries, Jews were very strong in professions. Um, were they in the civil service and in government, which happened even in Iraq? Uh, they, they were not uh, as well represented as, as in other Arab countries. Uh, there was a Jewish minister of post, I think Le, uh, Leon Benzaken ben in the late 1950s, but he didn't last very long. Um, and the Jews were a bit marginal to politics in Morocco. In fact, they weren't very well represented in the nationalist movement either. Uh, in, in Iraq, Jews could be nationalists and, and were nationalists in the 1920s. Um, there was nobody quite like Sir Sasson Heskel, who was the finance minister in, in Iraq. Uh, there was nobody quite like the finance minister of Egypt. Um, oh, his name I've, I've forgotten now. Um, so uh, they were very marginal to politics, I would say. Uh, they were not as well represented in the civil service as, say, the Algerian Jews, who really were the backbone of, of the French administration in Algeria. Um, and I think there was this rivalry for jobs uh, between the great mass of poor. Moroccan Jews and the great mass of poor Muslims, you know, and this was one of the factors uh, which also led to their emigration. Yes, you've answered exactly what I was asking. Oh, good. Excellent. That's wonderful. <laughs> right. Okay, Thank next you. one. I've got something from iPad to everyone, so I'm not quite sure who this is from. No. We're researching my bit, beer and identity. Do we do that? Uh, oh, wait, there's one from Arman. Uh, I, I, I was going to find that. Okay. I was going to find a picture for that one. So okay. the iPad right. Class. Okay. So, uh, iPad, whoever you are, <laughs> to everyone. Uh, researching my Iberian ancestry, there is DNA evidence that my family migrated from Morocco, where they'd been for many centuries after progressing along the Maghreb from Egypt. If I managed to find out, 
when they crossed into Iberia long before the Inquisition, is there any hope of tracing my Moroccan lineage? Right, well, you'd have to ask these uh, ancestry.com and you know other DNA uh, companies. <laughs> Uh, I really don't know what, what they might find there. But it is true that a lot of Jews can uh, trace their ancestry back to the Toshavim, to the, the original settlers uh, who were there, uh, you know, often in Berber areas in southern Morocco uh, and, and elsewhere. So I, I don't know if these, um, these companies who do the genetic testing can break it down to such an extent that you can trace exactly uh, when uh, or when when your family came uh, came into Morocco. All right. Okay. Hello. <laughs> okay. There's. Right. Would you want to reply to everyone? Yeah. Okay. Right, that? so Clive um, makes this comment. No, no, that's Suad. Su 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 yeah, Suad. So Clive says, in 1963, I went to work in Israel on a Turkish tramp steamer from Marseille. I was in steerage, but in even worse condition were Moroccan refugees. Was this a common route? Yes, it was, Clive. The way out of Morocco uh, after Operation Yahin was basically by ship to Marseille and then from there to Israel, um, also by boat, I think, or it, it could have been by plane. But basically the, the Moroccan Jews went to Marseille. They stayed in a camp called uh, Camp d'Arenas um, and uh, then they went on to Israel. Uh, so it was basically by ship, unlike the Iraqi Jews or the Yemeni Jews who actually flew uh, flew to Israel on an airlift. I'm still trying to find Sue. I can't see her. Arman Sue. I, I think she's probably logged off. I think it's further up. No, she's logged off. The oh, thing. Okay. okay. Uh, Nigel. Nigel. Hello, Nigel. Uh, the Rachmans, Canary Wharf, were in Morocco during World War II. I think they were part of this group of uh, refugees who escaped to Morocco, probably wanting to go to the US or, or Canada, I think, in their case. And it was a staging point, a staging post. Uh, you know, a lot of them uh, were congregating in, in Casablanca on their way to uh, the US and what whatnot. So I, that doesn't surprise me that they were in Morocco during World War II. Okay, so Sydney Corcos. Well, Nigel, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, you are Nigel. muted if you want to follow it up. No, 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 that's fine. I just wanted to say, you know, you asked the question about who was, about whether, German, whether Jewish refugees were there, and certainly the right ones were there. Right. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Right. Okay, I think we've probably gone through. Uh, wait, wait Can you raise your hand if you haven't had your question answered? Because I think I've answered most of them, and I will look in the participants and see who hasn't, who will let you ask your questions. I think that's the best way of doing it now, Lynn. Okay. Anyone raising their hand? All right. No one needs to go to the toilet. <laughs> I see no hands raised. Last call, or will thumb sum up. Somebody's phone. It's Nigel's. Yeah? You, me. I, so I think, okay, that's I think it. if there are no, uh, no more questions, then I think we'll, we'll wrap up. I'd like to thank you very much for, for coming to, uh, to this Zoom meeting. Um, it's been a great pleasure to give this talk. We're, we're going to have more talks. Uh, on the 5th of May, Daisy Aboudi will talk about Jewish Sudan and her trip back to Sudan to find her roots. That's the 5th of May. And on the 13th of May, Michelle Huberman will talk about her experience of living in Fez for three weeks over Ramadan 
last year. That's the 13th of May, and we're doing that with Spyro Arc once again. Now, please do visit our website, www.harif.org, for further details of all our talks. I hope to add more talks to this series, which I suppose you could call uh, Lockdown le Lectures with Harif. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to have you all here um, on the call, and I hope to see you again. Stay safe, stay well, and see you soon. Thank you.